Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to this IMRS TV webinar. Without further ado, I'd like to hand over to Renjeev, who's the chair of the Aberdeen Maritime Branch. Thank you. Welcome, everyone, to this event. Um, and those who have all joined online for this technical event uh, on the assurance of complex control systems for ships and option installations. As um, Daniel mentioned, I'm introducing myself as a chairman of the Maritime Branch. For those who have not, are not familiar uh, with the Maritime Branch, it's a joint branch of three institutions, uh, RENA, IMRS, and ISIS. Uh, this, this branch is based in, in, in Aberdeen, and we have around 1,300 members working in the Grampian area of Scotland. This was originally a, a physical event scheduled for end of March to be held in Aberdeen, but we had to cancel it because of the COVID issue. So I hope everyone is keeping healthy and safe in this current situation. I would like to now introduce three individuals associated with this event. First and foremost, Dr. Luca Pivana from DNVGL. Uh, Luca is a principal specialist in DP simulations at DNVGL um, uh, at, in control systems and cybernetics advisory. He joined DNVGL in 2007, where he first worked as a project engineer, and from 2010 to 2016 as R&D manager for DP systems, focusing on the development of tools and methods for control system testing with hardware and methodology. He received his MSc in electronic engineering from University of Torino in 2001 and a PhD degree in control and identification of marine propeller from uh, Norwegian Technology of Science and Technology in, in 2008. Uh, next is uh, Kevin Duffy. Um, he is the current president of IMRS. He also chairs a spe special interest group within IMRS for the marine electrical and control systems. Uh, so welcome to Kevin as well to this, this forum. Um, his special interest in this particular topic brings him and he is here to hear with us as well. Um, and not the last but least, it's, it's uh, uh, IMRS technical head, uh, Daniel Stoker, whose enthusiasm has helped us actually host this event when we started exploring the options of having this event, even though we canceled the original physical event. So uh, welcome to Daniel as well to this event. Um, so over to you, Luca. Um, we are all quite keen to, rather than me going through any of the, any further introductions into what this topic is, I think it's better to hear from your own mouth. Thank you, Arun and all for the nice introduction. Hope uh, you're all safe and uh, you can hear me well. Uh, today we are going to talk about uh, assurance of control, complex control systems for ships and offshore installations. Uh, let me see if I have shared the screen. The agenda for today, we have a brief introduction. Uh, we'll talk about the challenges in the offshore maritime industry regarding uh, the system you're talking about. So automation, complex control systems. Uh, we'll show the and describe the, our digital twin concept because there are so many digital twin around. So I think it's good to have a definition of that. Um, I will describe and show some experience from, from testing with simulators and show you a bit the way forward with the open simulator platform. And also, depending on time, I will show you what else we can do with simulator. All right. So I was already introduced. So I've been in, in the business for about 13 years, working mainly in, in, uh, in DP control systems. Uh, I'm part of the NVGL, which is a company with more than 12,000 employees. We have uh, more than 250 offices around the world, in more than 100 countries. Uh, one interesting thing that we devote 5% of our revenue into R&D. And we have five mainly main business areas, maritime, oil and gas, energy, distant assurance and digital solutions. So you can read more in our website. I'm coming from the Trondheim office. You see here on the, on the bottom right, there is a map, Norway. Uh, I mean, Trondheim is one third of the, the, of the length of Norway from, from, uh, from south, from Oslo. It's about 500 kilometers north of Oslo. And we have about 80 people in, uh, in Trondheim. And I'm working in a unit called Maritime Advisory, where we mainly deal with the third party testing of software with simulators and also using simulators and simulations for uh, performance analysis of ships and vessels and so on. 
Uh, sometimes I got que uh, a question where, where we come from. Uh, yes, we come from uh, the legacy marine cybernetics, which was founded by some professor from university in Trondheim. And then we were being, we've been part of the MVGL since 2014. Okay, uh, looking to the challenges today. Uh, here you see a picture of the, the energy demand for the future. Uh, it has estimated that the, the demand peaks will be around 2030 and then will uh, gradually go down. Uh, of course, these estimates were, were sort of might may, may be accurate before we got this, because now, now it's a bit difficult to, to predict what the, the energy demand will be at least the next year because of the, of the, of the COVID-19 virus. But uh, if, if you look at anyway, uh, at, the, at the prediction we had in 2018 is that uh, in the future, in 20, let's say 2050, we still have the, the energy mix composed by oil and natural gas for about 50%, and then we will have uh, a renewable increasing. And we see today a large growth, especially in the offshore wind uh, sector. Uh, so the ongoing demand for energy, decreasing the supplies of traditional fossil fuel are, are pushing exploration further offshore and deeper more uh, challenging environment and as i said there is a, a big uh, a large growth in, in the offshore wind so there will be um, a six-fold increase on, on the power in uh, within uh, the next 10 years or something like this so it, it's, it's very huge so there are challenges for the operators which is to reduce operational cost and risk uh, there are increasingly complex systems. So we, we have uh, more data, more automation, more software. So, so this poses some challenges. How do we reduce the operating cost? And if you look, for example, uh, in particular to, to offshore wind, and when you want to drill in shallow water or challenging environment, how to, how to employ and pick up the right vessels. Uh, there are, as, as, I wrote, as I said here, there are some uh, increasingly complex hybrid physical systems. So, so I would like to spend uh, 30 seconds to define what the cyber physical systems are. So basically a, a system which are, are made composed by integration of uh, software and mechanical systems. You can think about uh, a dynamic positioning system where you want to keep the vessel in position by reading GPS measurements and, and your other post position reference systems and then you want to control the thrusters. So, so there is a, a combination between, uh, between uh, mechanical system and, and a lot of software. So those are the final cyber physical systems. So what are the challenges? Uh, we want to improve the operational philosophy. I take this example because we've been working uh, with Total in South Africa. Uh, you see in the map here in the South, uh, outside Port Elizabeth, there is a current called a goulash current, which is which can be very strong. It can change direction 180 degrees in about uh, six, seven hours. Uh, it's very challenging there because the current can reach about three, four meters per second. And then uh, and then also because it changed change of direction is can be quite uh, quickly, it's hard to stay in position. Uh, when they did the campaign in 2018, at the end of 2018. Uh, what they did, they, they, they drill with a tugboat pulling the, the drill rig. So, so to get help from the tugboat to stay in position, they, so they, they pull it uh, with, the, with two lines on the pontoons. To predict how the operation will, will be carried out, to predict cost, to prepare for the operations, also there is a need for innovative tools. Uh, this is a work we've done with Total again in South Africa. Uh, the question is here, if you get current from uh, east and wind and waves from west, where would you put the bow of your vessel if you have a drill ship? Would you put it towards the current or towards the wind and waves? But the answer is it depends on the, the, the magnitude of those. And uh, when to switch also is a challenge between uh, adding towards current and adding towards wind and waves. We want to have sufficient assurance of uh, cyber physical systems. Uh, this is uh, um, some statistic 
it was provided by the Petroleum Safety Authority in Norway. Summarizing the DP and the position moving incident from 2014-2018, and software was one of the main issues for this incident. Uh, again, for those which are familiar with the with the incident reporting, uh, incidents are typically underreported, and it's sometimes difficult to to deduce if this was a system error, it was a, a human error, or a combination, which is typically the case. Uh, so I'd like to show this slide, which was taken uh, from uh, Dr. John Thomas, MIT, because uh, typically the, the old view is that uh, most of the cases, the human errors is the one that's to blame. But uh, if you see the, the cooking plates here on the right, uh, uh, I'm not sure if you see, let me see if you see my laser pointer here. So in this case here, this, this uh, command says back right, which is this one, which is which on this one. This is front left, this is back left. So, so definitely this doesn't tap the, 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 the operator. So is this a design problem or is it a human error? Um, let me see, take this away. So the right design will definitely will help to reducing the, the, the errors from the humans. So this is, I think, is, is a good uh, is a good uh, comment also when, when it comes to our uh, complex systems in automation. Okay, uh, this image shows the the Vancouver Symphony Orchestra. Orchestra, I think, is a good analogy of complex integrated systems in our ships. Because to play well, the orchestra needs to be coordinated by the director, and they have to he has to coordinate all the individual musician. Each musician must have the necessary skills and has to be trained for the particular setting for that particular music. And also, all the inst instrument needs to be in tune and fit for the purpose, fit for the music. So, if you think about an orchestra, it's by all means a complex system, well, where they have a lot of uh, wide inter interactions. And the music the orchestra can play, you can't really deduce it by looking at every individual instrument or indiv individual uh, musician. So basically, you need you need a, 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 a an effort uh, which is uh, uh, by everyone to be to be to follow the, the 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 director and to be coordinated to produce a good melody. So, how does this relate to our ships and our complex systems? Well, you can think about the, the instrument is the equipment. So equipment made by different vendors. Uh, the, the musician is the software. You have a system integrator, which is the director, and then what they have to play, you can say, is the operation. Uh, as I said, uh, you can't deduce how they play, how the music will be played by looking at individual uh, uh, instrument of musician. And the same you can say about our ship. You can't, you can't really deduce how the ship will perform by looking at one engine. You have to look at the, at the, at the ship as a system, a whole integrated system. And what happens if uh, a string breaks here, for example? Well, it depends which music they're playing. If you have many violinists, if you have redundancy, you might not notice it. But if you play a solo, of course, you, you might you might hear, hear that. So, so also it's important that every musician is not only looking at what they are doing themselves and play themselves, but they have to look at what the other musicians are doing and the, what the system is, what the, the director is is, uh, is is doing. So it's like uh, it's like for for the ships, every vendor should not look at their only at their own uh, equipment, but they have to uh, make an effort such that the whole integrated system will function as uh, properly. So, so the orchestra is a very complex system, and then system, and then also you can think that the the, the ship is also a complex system. It's not it's not less uh, complex than an orchestra. So, what are the what are the challenges? Why are we looking at the complex integrated system? Well, today, as I said earlier, there is there is more software. There are more complex system and functions. This is not only maritime. Uh, Early in February, Equinur presented uh, an incident between uh, the Schoborg vessel and the Statfjord platform, where basically the integration between the system, uh, power system, the thrusters, and the DP was uh, one of the causes of this incident. So, so this is about the right time to look into this. 
we have also seen presentation about uh, auto crossing and auto docking of ferries as autonomous ships are coming fully integrated system for offshore wind installation more data more technology so so this is the reason why we're focusing even more on complex systems today and their integration because uh, we to look at the at the overall risk and pictures again we can't look at the individual component but we have to look at the system as a whole so if you think about the design of optimization we can take a uh, walk to work system as an example so so for what work systems you want to do maintenance to a wind installation for example you see here in the picture so you transfer people through the gangway and the gangway is typically motion compensated and when the gangway stroke or, or, or telescopic motion exceed the, their limits then you can't transfer the people anymore so you could buy a gangway that says, okay, you can work with this gangway up to three meter significant wave height. But if you put a gangway in a vessel which has a poor DP performance, then you're not able to work with up to three meter HS, maybe you work only up to two meter significant wave height. And also it depends where you put the gangway. If you put it in the stern, the gangway will move more than you put it in the, in the midship, for example. So, so it's important to have the right tool when you do we need to design uh, of this system, complex systems. Uh, so we want to put the system together. We want to, to ensure that the system uh, are working fine. Uh, as today, typically, the integration is done uh, during the new build phase, where the first time you put system together, it's typically the yard time. So when you're in the yard and you put things together, if something goes wrong, it's quite late and it's very costly to fix. So not, not only we need to put things together, the system together, but also we need to ensure that the system are safe, is stable, especially especially in, the, in the, um, let's say, normal condition, but also in failure conditions. What happens if you, if, you, if you lose a thruster, so if you, if, you look at, if you break a mooring lines and so on, There are complex operations and human machine interaction. So if I go back to the walk to work, again, you want to transfer people to a platform and you want to maximize your operability, meaning that uh, you want to minimize the vessel motion such that uh, the gunway can, can be, can be is able to compensate for the motion and you, tra you can transfer people. Uh, so where you place the, the bow your vessel or you position the vessel depends on, on the weather direction and depends also on the ability of the gangway to perform uh, motion compensation and depends on how good your DP performance is and, and so on. So it's not easy to, to do this without proper tool. I mean, the you, human can do some optimization, but this is too complex for, for a human to do. So you need a proper tool for that. Change management. So typically there are software updates during the vessel life cycle. And and sometimes I've seen vessels that uh, it has been updated and then I've seen that uh, uh, the vendor, they forgot some parameter from the previous uh, version and then the vessel was not stable in position after the update. So it would be, it would be beneficial that you could efficiently test those changes before you put them on board. Last, cyber security. So I'm not going to discuss cyber security in this presentation, um, but the, Typically, you don't want to update your system when they're working on board, because uh, because uh, well, when you update something, you might you might also introduce some side effects. But sometimes you're forced to because you need to patch your system for security. So again, you need to you need to test the software and the system before you put it uh, on board the ship. And, th and this needs also some some procedures and some uh, uh, good tools for that. Okay, and we need to do this in, uh, with cost-efficient solutions. That, that's also, it's, it's since 14, since the, the oil crisis, uh, the, the amount of uh, investment that are, that are uh, available is, is being reduced, so you have to be more, more efficient than, than ever. Uh, there are some other issues and other, other uh, challenges. Uh, like crew competency, uh, we want to extend the equipment limits and HSC and so on. This is uh, uh, not part of uh, what we are discussing here. 
Uh, so we, we will discuss mainly on the force four points here. Okay, so what we do for, for testing those systems. So we have a digital twin concept. Uh, there are many definitions of digital twins. One definition is that a digital twin is a 3D model of your structure, for example, the components. Someone says that this analytical model of structures and hydrodynamics. Some says it's a, it's an information models or um, sensor models and networks, etc. So what we are focusing here is time domain models of component systems. Uh, we are looking at the software driven control algorithms. So what does this mean that when we, for example, want to build a digital twin of a rig, we want to uh, build a, a simulator or um, that basically is able to reproduce quite accurately the, the motion and the and the, how the system and components are, are behaving on the rig. Things about the GPS, thrusters, uh, thruster dynamics, environmental forces, thrust losses, power system dynamics, because you can't get the power immediately, but there is some, there are some dynamics there too. And we have a complete uh, vessel motion, so roll even pitch and, and the horizontal motions. Uh, I hope you can see the video. Let me know if you if this does move. Yeah, perfect. So what we do, for example, when we want to test a DP control system, is that we replace the, the the actual vessel with a simulator. So for the system you want to control, like the DP control system, there is no difference between on board or being in, in the lab with a simulator. But the, the difference is that in the lab you can test a lot more cases, a lot more weather, a lot more combination of uh, also um, vessel setups, power setups, configuration, and, 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 uh, and environmental conditions. Some of the benefits of doing this with a simulator is that you, you can do this early enough. You don't need to, to wait when the system is put on board because we can do it easily at the lab. We have seen that uh, bringing the stakeholder in the same place is at a, uh, in an early stage, improve the interaction between among them, and, and some things are clarified before before things things are put on board. We test more than uh, what you can test at sea because you can control the environmental conditions, you can uh, control the vessel setup more quickly, and you can test more combination of uh, of failures as well. Experience from testing says that uh, after we done this test, we we shorted the commission time. Because uh, if you if you remove and reduce a lot of issues, especially integration issues before the the, the system are put on board, then of course when they are put on board, uh, you can save some time. Also, we ensure the system are fit to purpose, and uh, when we build a simulator, we, we can maintain the simulator during the vessel life cycle, so we can test also and verify changes later. We've been working. Uh, quite a bit on that, especially for drill rigs and, and drill systems. As today, we have more than 200 projects. We, uh, we have run more than 60,000 tests on different systems. Uh, we can test uh, power management systems, thruster systems, DP systems, blowout preventers, cranes. We've been testing jacking fixation systems. Uh, emerging shutdown, drilling systems, uh, and so on. So the slides will be distributed later, so you, you can you can see see it later and, and ask some questions if you if you like. So one of the sort of uh, application of this type of testing is is uh, what we call uh, enhanced postmortem AAT assurance. When you have a rig, you want to a drill rig. Here you see it on the right. Uh, let's see here. Yeah. You can stay in position uh, by using thrusters. So when the weather comes, the thruster will, put, will push against the weather. Uh, but you can also use mooring lines. So you see here you have chains and that go, go, um, going down here means that uh, you, uh, you chain your, your rig and you stay in position by both using thrusters and help from the chain. So the MVGL has a class notation called Postmurata. And typically, we are only able to, to release this class notation uh, um, at the first drilling location. The reason is, when you have a new build, we run the traditional test. You have a factory acceptance test, customer acceptance test, various FMEA, mechanical tests, and so on. 
but we can't really test the post-mortem system because uh, either there is the, the water depth is not uh, high enough or the, the, the lines are not available and so on. So often we end up doing, doing the, the class notation uh, test at the first drill, drilling location. And, and it might take some time from when the vessel is built to the first drilling location before we release the class notation. And this has been a, a headache for our customers. So can you do something with that? And also when you move between different locations, you need to have different moving analysis, Me meaning that uh, when you have your, your uh, chain pattern, you need to make sure that uh, the, the, the rig can, uh, and the chain can sustain some uh, loads before they break. So this analysis needs to be approved. Uh, when you move from one location to another location, you, have, you might change your moving pattern and the control system might behave differently. So, so sometimes the vendor might tune, sometimes might not, depends if they're calling or not, but sometimes they're not calling, but the, the rig gets trouble in positioning and then the vendor are calling in, in a hurry. Okay, please come and tune the system. It's not, uh, it's not good for this uh, water depth or something. So the question is how to improve the post-Murata control system assurance. Are we able to issue the class notation new build? They can reduce cost at the same time. So what we have done, we have built a, a digital twin of the, of the rig, boring lines and environment. And basically we test at the lab, uh, simulating the right water depth, the right uh, chain behavior. And then uh, we can run a lot more tests that uh, we can run at sea. And then the, the VJ class is able to uh, issue the class notation at the new, new build phase. We are, we are working towards uh, testing in the cloud to even reduce uh, further uh, cost and increase efficiency. I, I'll go back on, on that later. Uh, I have a couple of examples of tests that we done uh, last year. Uh, this is a diamond of shore rig, the ocean great white. We tested for five days on a vendor site and we issued a class notation after that. Alternatively, alternatively they should have uh, hired um, uh, anchor handlers, hire the lines and do some testing uh, outside uh, and find the right water depth to get the class notation. So we, we, it was a direct cost saving in this case. Same with the Stena drill, drilling the Stena doll, where we tested again for five days. Uh, and we have also a retest of two days to fix the issues that were, found, that were found in the first test. And we provided the class notation. And again, as for the diamond offshore vessel, uh, we save uh, uh, five days of testing with the anchor enders and logistics uh, uh, renting lines and so on. The, the, the rig was also able to start drilling five, five days ahead of schedule. Okay, so where are we heading with the future? So I'm going to talk about the open simulator platform. So what we're trying to establish here uh, is a platform that will, um, will help to collaborate with digital twin simulations to solve the, solve the challenges of designing, commissioning, operating, and assuring complex integrated systems. So to solve the challenges that I have uh, des described earlier and to do it in an efficient way, we want to create a, a, an ecosystem, basically a simulator platform, which is open that where people can collaborate and test early or early enough in the in the system so one of the key elements here if you want to be cost efficient we need to reuse model so today for example when we when we test a post move system we create all the models but typically models are available but they are they are they are you know they are they are staying at the at the vendors or at the one that have created the models so Instead, we want to reuse the models that are created uh, in the build phase of the building phase of the of the ship or the rig or the installation. So and we want to have people to share them to create the simulators. But to share the models, you need to have uh, IPR protection. So one of the module uh, or the properties of this open simulator platform is that we need to take care of uh, IPR. So if you share a model, for example, in the platform, you only see your model, you don't see someone else's model. We need to be able to do cost simulation, meaning that uh, 
if I share my model and another one shares his model, so we need to be able to simulate model coming from different parts. Uh, for doing that, we need to have common standard. And the standard will also will be also released uh, released soon, and we have decided to do open source to have a faster uh, adaptation in industry. So the most important thing is that we have to co collaborate. If you don't collaborate, this will not work. But the, the idea is just to create sort of a trust center in the cloud where people can collaborate and and share the models and test and test continuously for changes in software and compute systems. The Open Simulator platform is run as a joint industry project. You see some of the partners here. It was uh, founded by Consper Maritime, the NVGL, and the newest Intef. And then uh, we got along a lot of other, a lot of other company. You see here in this slide. So basically, this is the slide that I shown before. We want to go from. Uh, from finding issues related in the in the, in the system integration process and do a continuous verification and start early, such that we can reduce costs in case we find the issues in the software and the control system. I'm not sure if I run a video, this will, will show on your side. Uh, but anyway, the video will, and the links will be distributed so, so you can uh, take a look later. It's a two minutes video summarizing uh, um, what is what that, what OSP is, and, and you, you get some links about uh, uh, where you can get some information. Okay, so what else can we do with the simulator? Again, we, we are building a nice simulator, for example, for a rig, and then uh, uh, what are other applications? One, one of the things we've been working on is, uh, is uh, dynamic simulations on in DP. So station keeping simulations, you see here on the right is, is a rig uh, where we have uh, simulated with uh, some weather. So we have environmental forces uh, here. And then you, you, you're fighting back with the thrusters. Basically, you want to stay in position. And uh, you see here the footprint. So, so the vessel is staying within two, three meters. So this is just one example, but basically you can run a, a batch simulation, a structure simulation to see what are the limitations of, the, of uh, your rig in different conditions. Um, you can check what is the fuel consumption and, and, uh, and, and uh, emissions and so on. So we did a, a full scale validation in, in South Africa with the total on a um, in a Marsh V class series drill ship, where the goal we want to see uh, and evaluate the station keeping performance in high, high current. As I mentioned earlier, the Angular's current is very very strong, so so it is uh, it's challenging to drill in that in that environment. And also, what was the vessel motion in, in my in high, in medium and high waves? So here you see some of the results of the full scale validation. So we collected some data and then we build a simulator and then we compare the simulation, which are the, is the red curve here with the measurement. So typically when you compare 10 domain simulations in waves, you're not able to reproduce the same pattern because the wave have some random effects, but you can look at statistics. Like uh, for example, you can look at the, how big is the radius and the pattern. For example, you see quite quite well uh, the the red the red curves are are more or less on the same size. This is position on the same size as uh, of the measurement. This is another case, one of the worst cases in positioning where the the vessel went off about uh, six six and a half meters, and the simulation showed or uh, eight meters, and the simulation showed uh, about six meters. But the patterns are quite similar. If you see um, here, this is the simulation. So the vessel was moving back and forth like this, and then in reality, that was doing something like this. Also, we've been looking at the uh, roll event pitch. 
and we were able to, to simulate the role event pitch quite uh, quite accurately, at least uh, with the needed accuracy for, for this project. Another interesting case we did is that uh, uh, we were looking at uh, semi-submersible in shallow water. So in shallow water, typically, you have little time to disconnect the riser because as soon as you move a bit from your position, your riser will have some angles and then you can't see five, six degrees angles, so you have to disconnect. So the question from the, from the customer was, do we have sufficient time to disconnect before you break the riser? So we did the, we did the same drive, drive off analysis, meaning that uh, we simulate a, a full blackout and we measure how far the vessel was going. You see here uh, on the bottom right, you have time and here you have distance. So, so here when you start with the blackout and then the, the vessel is drifting, the rig is drifting and then reach 10 meters in about 140 seconds. So this area, the weather is not so 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 harsh, um, and then you see we have a the the sea trial is the red line here. You see, I'm not sure if you see well the colors, but uh, the point is we were able to simulate uh, quite uh, accurately uh, the data were recorded on a full scale. Summarizing is that. Uh, uh, do we have sufficient time to disconnect? If you work on the ash weather season, no, the answer is no. So they, they haven't considered running a campaign during the ash weather season because there is, there is no not enough time for disconnection. But you can do it on the mild weather season. Another uh, example is we've been working more and more for work to work, both for uh, an unmanned platform um, for oil and also for uh, for offshore wind. As I have uh, said earlier, when we do this type of simulation and study, we have to look at the whole system. We have to look at the vessel motion positioning, the gangway system, we have to look at the, the receiving platform. So it's important that you, you see this as a, as a system, not uh, looking at individual components. Typically, uh, uh, static analysis are very optimistic because you, you need to consider the DDP motion because when the vessel will move in DP, it will move back and forth. So your, your gangway stroke will, uh, will stand and will contract. So, and that will reduce your probability if you, if you exceed your, your gangway stroke limits. Also, uh, the ability of the gangway to compensate the motion is very important. And where you put the gangway on the vessel is also very important. If you put it here on the stern, you can see, here on the stern, the pitch motion will, will make the gangway go up and down. So, so you have to compensate for that motion. But if you put it here in the middle, typically the motion is less. So, so you have better operability or better motion, but uh, doesn't mean you have better operability. Depends also how many landing points you are in your platform. If you have one landing point, if you put the gangway in the middle, then you, you probably can, can have this direction all the time for the ship. So if the weather changes, you might not be able to stay in position. But if you have the gangway and the stir, you might be able to, to move the, the vessel more freely. So so again, which one is, is best? Well, it depends on the operation where you, uh, the, the location where you're working. So you need to look at the weather condition as well. We've been working with the shuttle tankers. Uh, evaluate uh, the position performance with different propulsion systems. Also, we run uh, cases to produce time series for battery sizing. So it was the first uh, uh, attempt to sort of simulate the, that uh, certain type of propulsion system. And we, we run it with the weather from the location to see what would be the, the power consumption and power utilization. And then and from there, try to estimate the um, the power, the battery sizing. As I said, we've been doing some drilling in shallow water, uh, post more other configuration and testing. Uh, we provided the simulation for uh, battery sizing and fuel saving. Also, another thing we do often is that uh, we are looking at the, the after the worst case single failure uh, condition. Because let's say you're in, in intact conditions, everything looks good. Also, the, the post-failure capability 
might also be good after the vessel recovered. But sometimes we are asking, okay, what happens exactly in the moment where you have the failure? Are you going out of position and can come back in, or you stay in within the, the your your, uh, your limits? So this is another application we can we can run with the with those simulations simulators. All right, uh, a couple of minutes more, I think. Um, I would like to say that uh, uh, we have also put this simulation as a as a web tools in, in the in Veracity, which is uh, the DGL uh, uh, platform. So if you want to run the pick capability analysis, you can go on Veracity. Uh, there is a um, an app called the pick capability assessment. Uh, there are different levels. So the simple the simplest level is for free. You can run analysis and then uh, get the report and some results. Uh, you can run more complex analysis. Uh, you have to pay for that. But anyway, if you're interested, you can go there and, uh, and take a look and have questions if you like. Also, we are looking at uh, putting, these are for static analysis. We are looking at putting uh, time domain analysis also in the same web app. All right, I think uh, that that is, that's it. This is what I have, uh, have to, have to show. Hope you enjoy it and uh, hope you have some good question. Hi, right. um, thanks, thanks, Luca. I think uh, we have some questions coming in. Um, there is one question uh, which I got from Nigel is, what is your approach to modeling software? Do you make use of um, commercial packages or everything is done by from proprietary packages? Good, good question. Uh, if you look at the, uh, sorry. See, I have a double answer in this. Uh, so, if you look at uh, our digital twin, as today we are running it uh, um, with the with the commercial uh, um, software. We use Simulink MATLAB, but the, basically it's a, it's a wrapping between uh, you wrap the model, which you can be made by any any language in a way, can be MATLAB, can be Simulink, can be Modelica, can be C, C++, doesn't matter. Uh, when we are moving towards the Open Simulator platform, uh, sorry for that. So when we want to share the models and, and connect the model from different uh, actors and, and, uh, and people, we use something called FMU FMI, which is uh, um, functional mockup mo interface, which comes from uh, automotive industry. So this is a standard uh, interface that's made for in the car industry to share models. Because for example, Volkswagen, when now you want to deliver a component to Volkswagen, you need to deliver also a, a mathematical model. So we are doing the same here. We use the common standard for that. So you can create the model as with the tool that you prefer. So as long as this is uh, the interface complies to the FMU, FMI um, um, standard, then it be, could be fine. Good. And there's another question um, here. Uh, I think probably it's very relevant to what you already mentioned, Luca. If there is a digital twin created, are the control system software of the equipment required to be kept as well? Uh, let, let's say we, we, are, we are focusing on testing software. So let's say at the new build, we, we connect to the vendor software, we test it, then the software is updated, then we test it again. So we don't need to keep it, uh, uh, keep it because we connect to it. There is an interface between the simulator and the software and the control system we want to test. So we don't need to keep it. Um, but I have a question related to that, Luca. So if yeah. we are dealing with existing units where you may not have access to all this information from all the vendors, how do you deal with them? Especially for a, a, a simulation. Uh, 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 yes. So so we have created some models based on experience and, and open literature. And when we do testing, the first thing we do is called validation. So we make sure that the simulator talks to the control system in the right way, producing the right signal. And that uh, basically the control system acknowledge that uh, the simulator is, is accurate enough for the, for the testing. Um, 
I think one of the the, the goals of the, the Open Simulator platform is that uh, it will allow to use even more uh, vendor models because uh, uh, the vendor are the one that create the, the best model for the equipment at the end of the day. So it will be interesting to to share these models and and, and making this uh, IPR IPR model on the platform makes it uh, possible that you share only you see only what you share yourself, you don't see what the other are sharing, but you see the other models as a black box. Okay, okay, thank you. And um, there's another question from Henrik here. Uh, what is the difference in the price of FME analysis and digital twin model? Probably that's something if you, if you want uh, to take. Yeah, good question. It depends, of course, uh, the quality of the FMEA, it depends which system you're testing. Uh, one common is that the software tests in FMEA are complementary activity activities are not something that one replaces the other. Because uh, when we look at the P control system, for example, the FMEA is for checking redundancy, uh, checking you don't have uh, problem after worst case single failure. Uh, of course, in, in a way we do the same way we test the system, but we focus more on software rather than uh, the components redundancy. Okay, I think uh, um, one question from me, uh, Luca. Um, Probably one of the most recent incidents, you know, actually not memories, are the two incidents involving the Boeing 737 MAX incidents. Yeah. Uh, is, is, you mentioned about testing software errors and how um, the complex systems are brought together. Is that something the same principle should apply for other industries similar to, that could have prevented similar incidents which you have seen for Boeing 737 MAX? Is that something you should yeah, I think uh, I've been looking into the Boeing uh, incident and I think uh, a simple test would avoid that problem because you could test the one failure in one, in one uh, sensor and see what would be the reaction of the system. I think in that case, they, they, they cut short uh, the number of tests. So, so and also what we are doing is here is not something that we have invented, but actually comes from the uh, automotive industry the way you test uh, the, the CPUs and the control unit in the loop with the, with the hardware. So, so we are just applying what sort of best practices from other industry, some airspace and aviation and, and car industry to the maritime and, and offshore industry. Okay, great. Um, there's one question here. Um, it mentions the simulation examples you showed uh, are similar to how mooring analysis are typically run. Could you provide a little more detail on how it's different to what it is done for a typical Mooring analysis? No, that, that is correct. But for a typical Mooring analysis, you you don't use the you don't connect your your simulator with a with a system you want to test. Let's say the simulator and, and the model can be the same as the one you use for Mooring analysis. So exactly what you you said is like we, we can use uh, where is the um, we can use this one for Moolean analysis as well. We are using that. But then when you do that, you assume uh, you, you don't have uh, access to the DP control system or the Moolean control system, but you, you, you assume the system will work in, a, in some way. But then uh, when we do the software testing, we, we don't simulate the, the Moolean system, but we connect the actual Moolean system to the simulator to see the actual control system will behave upon failures. Also, let's say in 100% of the test, 70% of the test is failure testing, 30% is functional testing. So um, a Moolean analysis is sort of, you, you, you do a performance evaluation, which is uh, something we do a little bit, but uh, we mainly focus on testing of functionalities and the failure handling of the software. Um. I cannot see any more questions uh, for the audience who are out there. Any more questions you want to ask, Luca? I think we have another probably five five minutes more. Is that okay with you, Luca? Yeah, yeah, yeah no problem. Ranjeev, I've got a question for uh, Luca, if it's okay to ask. Yes, proceed, Kevin. Uh, yeah, Luca. So, have you been looking at um, the impact of non-deterministic control systems like machine learning and artificial intelligence, which seem to be becoming more prevalent yeah. now, especially in autonomous systems? Yes. Um, our uh, group research and technology, so our R&D 
teams is looking at uh, those. They actually writing a standard on uh, how to test uh, those type of systems. It's not easy to test a system that changes and evolves. It's not this task. And uh, one comment they, they made is that uh, we believe it's probably the only way possible is to do it with simulators because the amount to test for a post more system, we test maybe 100, uh, we have 100 uh, test cases. For an autonomy system, maybe you have 10,000 test cases. You, you can't do it manually. You can't do it with, uh, you have to do it automatically with simulator or some other means because it's, it's too complex. Yeah, thank you. No problem. One question related to uh, previous uh, government uh, response you gave to one question which came from the audience. Uh, you mentioned the FME and digital to, digital to an assessment are complementary. So, and you just mentioned about failures and failure testing and functional testing. Do you, any, any kind of testing is you do, are it coming from a kind of FME analysis and those scenarios are described from those analysis or you define that as part of your testing? Maybe, maybe some are, are sort of common, but uh, just to give an example, uh, for the FMEA, typically, you might make some system not available or unplug the system or unplug the cables. For uh, when we test, for example, the wind sensors, we, we typically don't test if the wind is not available because that's sort of FMEA test, but we, we test what happens if the wind speed drifts. So, so let's say that the, the failures are a bit more sophisticated than FMEA, put it this way. So you can you can have a jump of the on the signal. I, I guess if you had a signal generator, you could do it on board the ship to simulate different uh, different uh, behavior of the, the uh, and, and the response from the sensors. But uh, I think it's much easier to do it with a simulator and to program it with a simulator to do it in a structured way. I think here is another question coming from the audience, um, from Nigel. Is is the vessel response based on input? Vessel properties such as RIO data or something more fundamental like diffraction analysis? For, for, the, for both the, the motion and, and the weight drift forces, we use diffraction analysis. So we, we have a 3D models that we put uh, inside, we run it in the hydrodynamics code to get, uh, to get um, yeah, the first order and then the weight drift forces coefficients to, to, for, uh, for a time domain simulations. Um, there's no question again on the, on the panel, but uh, I have another question here, um, Luca. It, it, it looks like you, you are doing a lot of testing and, and a lot of these complex systems are very specialized. So you, you, earlier you showed one model, uh, we've done a slide where you, you kind of showed several complex systems on a, on a ship, for example. Yeah. And for example, if you're talking about uh, drilling systems or any yeah. other, uh, mm -hmm. and they're all very specialized. And yes. how important is specialist knowledge of the systems in your testing those um, systems? I think it's, it's quite important. If I, if I take two systems, for example, the power management system and the DP, typically, if you, if you think about uh, core software, means software is always the same. And then you think about like handling of uh, voting systems. If you have three sensors, one fails, one is rejected, for example, and so on. Those are core functionalities. For a DP control system, maybe this is 80% of the, of the software. Meaning that the, the software engineer has to configure, let's say, 20% or something of the software. But when it comes to drilling and power management, maybe 50, 60% is unique. So, so typically, we, we, we find a lot more issues in those systems where you have more... Uh, more custom-made solutions, more coding, more uh, different parameters, and so on. And when it comes to, to drilling, um, and, or, and your question about uh, competence, I think what makes the difference is not the simulator. Simulator is just a tool to achieve your, your goal, right? So what made the difference is our ability to dig into issues, to, to experience, to you know, what they say, the bugs, they never come alone. So if you find something, you need to look around those issues to see if you find something else. So, so it's a lot of testing experience and, and testing capability. And of course, the simulators is, should be good enough, but not, nothing more than that. 
Okay, that's good. I think we have time for one more question here. That has come through the through slider. In case where one input is a date, um, sorry, I'm, as an instance of a refined range and configuration of data, would you test? I'm so sorry, I'm not fully capturing that. Would you test for an impossible date as in 30th of February? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you can do that, of course. So uh, we we did that for um, uh, for GPS GPSs. So in the GPS telegram, you have a you have different uh, um, you have a, yeah you have time you have a different uh, telegrams and some telegrams are are valid all in one range. So we did some in a period of test where where we were just writing a out of range telegram like wrong date or wrong time or, or something, because there's been issues, some uh, drilling rigs on, on those, on those telegrams for uh, GPSs and, uh, and this, uh, and the, because the, the, often the clock from the, in the system is taken from the GPS. So the answer is yes. I think that's uh, all the questions and I think your time is up now. Well, thank you very much, Luca. Um, that was an absolutely fascinating lecture on, on the assurance of complex control systems. Um, and the topic really, um, it does fully support the Institute's mission on being a learned society and, and enhancing professional development of our members. Um, this is a topic that's really um, dear to my heart as part of my um, marine electrical and control system safety um, SIG. Um, I know in the offshore industry, simulation has saved millions of dollars for offshore oil and gas in mission, um, in platforms and in, in, in operational wells. Um, and um, it's, really in, it's really good to hear that you're learning a lot from other industries like aerospace and automotive and bringing some of those techniques into the marine and offshore domain. Um, and we need to look at how we can bring this technology into other parts of marine, especially the sort of complex control systems we have in naval ships, um, other types of fish uh, ships. And of course, we're, we're moving into more autonomous technology and situation awareness as well. So mm. I think you, you're building on a really good platform there. Um, so on behalf of the Institute and the Aberdeen branch, I'd really like to thank you for taking the time to prepare and deliver what was an excellent lecture and giving up your time to do that. And on behalf of the Institute, I'd really like to thank Ranjeef and the Aberdeen branch for organising this and putting this on. And I really thank everybody for their time. Particular thanks for Daniel there doing the, uh, the broadcast and giving us the technology. And um, I hope that it's inspired many of you to think about perhaps uh, putting for yourselves forward for lectures for the, the IMRS through any of the branches uh, or any of the uh, vehicles that we have for delivering um, this on our IMRS TV. So um, I'd just like to say thank you everybody for your time today and uh, we hope to see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Thank you all and take care. Bye-bye.